So once again, thank you all for, for joining us and welcome to you all and especially to Joanna Pollard, who's going to be leading us through this Future of Fair Trade campaigning session. So I'm now going to mute myself um, and pass over to Joanna. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thanks, Sally. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, as I say, my, uh, my name is Joanna Pollard. I'm the um, chair of the National Campaigner Committee. Um, I was elected about two months ago uh, to that position. I've actually only been part of the National Campaigner Committee since last summer. Um, so the committee basically consists of uh, representatives from all of the regions and nations around the UK. Uh, so Scotland, Wales, uh, I've was the Yorkshire representative. I'm actually moving over to the Northwest, so I'm going to be representing that region um, shortly. But we have people from all over the UK and lots of different uh, interests and backgrounds. Um, uh, my background is um, I've been a fair trade campaigner for the last 15 years. I started my business in 2005 as a fair trade business um, and then got involved in BAFTS, which is the Association for Fair Trade Shops, where the UK's uh, network member of WFTO, uh, obviously Shed Interest is also a member of WFTO, um, and we have created a community of the fair trade shops and suppliers that you have in your communities um, and who are basically promoting the ideas about around fair trade. Um, I was the uh, I was on the board of BAFTS for six years, which is two full terms. Uh, I was also the chair for the last four. So I've got a real sort of background in working within um, lots of different types of fair trade. Um, my current local group is the York Fair Trade Forum, um, and um, I was instructed involved in getting fair trade status for um, Glossopdale when I when I lived over there. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, and I'll uh, start to share some of my ideas about where fair trade campaigning is going for us in the UK. Okay, so this is me. Um, some of you may have um, signed my petition last year. Um, I was asked last year to front the campaign for Kit Kat to, to um, stay fair trade. Now, Nestle, about 10 years ago, um, decided that they wanted to go fair trade with the Kit Kats, uh, the four finger and, and two finger Kit Kats, which was a fantastic thing for them to do. Um, and it had a huge impact on the, the cocoa and sugar farmers over the last 10 years. And um, what's happened is that one of the big problems we had was that a lot of fair trade campaigners felt that we shouldn't be working with multinationals. We shouldn't be working with the sort of people who have a bad reputation. Um, so Nestle has always been renowned. There's, there's been boycotts against Nestle for at least 40 years, as far as I can remember. Um, and there was a thought that maybe we shouldn't be working with people like that. And so when it came round to last summer, and Nestle made the announcement that they were moving away from fair trade and setting up their own certification scheme, then we had a bit of a problem. And so I was asked to be the, the face of the campaign to keep Kit Kat fair trade, to support the farmers and workers in the global south who were growing the cocoa and sugar that was going into um, Kit Kats. Um, so one of the best ways that we can campaign mobilize and to, uh, to do petitions so my petition which i put up on change.org it ended up with 285,000 people all over the world signing it um and the image that you can see here is is the day of action that we had on the first of october um where we a uh, group of us from york fair trade forum uh went and stood outside the nestle headquarters in york and protested basically so those are the two of the sort of really active Active ways that uh, that we can campaign within our communities and within fair trade. So, um, fair trade communities. Um, what? I suppose internationally it's called the Fair Trade Towns Movement. Now, most of you probably know who Bruce Crowther is. Bruce started the Fair Trade Towns Movement. Um, he, he had the idea in 1994, and the first Fair Trade Town was Garstang, and that was 20 years ago. Uh, this year, actually, the 22nd of November, I'm, I'm reliably informed, was the first time that um, a, a community was granted Fair Trade Town status. 
um, this, these were, this is the last statistics that, that I can find. So it's from a couple of years ago, but you can see fair trade communities is the way that we have traditionally campaigned for fair trade in the UK. One of the reasons the National Campaigner Committee is made up of regions and nations is because there are so many fair trade communities, um, almost 700 it just in the UK and around about 2000 around the world. Um, and it has a big impact um, because people are working in the way that it that works for with them within their communities. Um, then they they know that some of them have got local fair trade shops that they like to work with. Others have great relationships with the co-op or they'll work with people like shared interests. They'll be, they'll be working with whoever it is within their community that they think will have the big, biggest impact. Um, and all of this has been coordinated traditionally by the Fair Trade Foundation. Um, so Fair Trade Communities is a great way of campaigning. It means that you can work locally, but you can take part in national and also global actions. World Fair Trade Day was last month uh, and lots of communities got on board with that. Um, it had a, the, the, the sort of slogan was uh, build back fairer, which I think we can all agree with that that's something that we, uh, we need to be uh, getting on board with. Building back fairer has it's a it's a sort of obvious thing but actually we've been given an opportunity by the pandemic to think about what we want to do and whether the world works and we as fair trade campaigners know that the world doesn't work for everybody it doesn't work for the farmers and workers and artisans in the global south who make the things that we we love to buy um, and so changing that has felt like something that, that we could get on board with as we move out of the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> the goals for fair trade communities, there's five set goals to do with the amount of products that are freely available in your community. You need to set up a steering group, which obviously means that it, it can't just be one person working on their own. Quite often it is with one or two people helping them. Um, the local council, it's really important that we get local authorities on board um, and the local council traditionally, they've had to pass a resolution and they have to commit to, to serving fair trade refreshments in their meetings. Now, one of the problems, of course, right now with refreshments in meetings is that there are none because all of the meetings are virtual. So anybody that's trying to do that at the moment, they're really struggling. Um, and then it's about being able to promote the work that um, that fair trade does in the global south, and 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 how we um, pull together to support that work, getting it into your local paper, so publicising it on social media, all of the different things that we can do to help and promote and support that. Um, and over six hundred fair trade places in the UK, over two thousand globally. The UK is only one of 180 countries, so you can see that there are far more fair trade places in the UK proportionately compared to, to globally. And there are, I think, several reasons for that. And one of the reasons is because the Fair Trade Foundation has taken um, ownership of the, the whole sort of fair trade communities idea. Um, and so they coordinate the whole thing around the UK. And it's really, really simple because it's about the fair trade markets. Look for products with this mark. Yorkshire is a fair trade region, as you can see, and all fair trade communities get one of these little logos that they can use, whether they're a town or village or zone, whatever. Um, but the simple message is it's about that mark. Um, this is what fair trade campaigning used to look like. This is me a couple of years ago um, at a local event in, in York. Uh, we had a um, breakfast meeting um, every fair trade fortnight and we would invite local councillors, local business people to come along and find out more about fair trade. This is something that all fair trade communities, it's, it's the sort of thing that, that, you know, that happens all around the country during fair trade fortnight. So this is what campaigning used to look like. And this is what campaigning has looked like for the last 12 months. Um, this is actually the Baths conference that we did uh, last month. Um, and as part of, um, it was the day after World Fair Trade Day. So we were going for sort of build back fairer as a message, but also it's part of the wave of hope. Now the wave of hope is something that, the, that we're doing 
um, in conjunction with lots of other charitable organisations um, and it's for the G7 so that's something that's coming up in the next couple of weeks and so we're encouraging people to um, make hands and um, basically promote the idea of a wave of hope um, because the G7's in Cornwall and it's coastal and the, you know, the idea of waves, um, it felt like something that, that the Fairtrade Foundation should be getting in, involved with. Um, I, a couple of years ago, it was the 25th birthday of the Fairtrade Mark. Um, so this is 2019 and um, I spent a Saturday morning drawing a massive fair trademark on the, the Trinity Square in Hull um, and then we got some volunteers to come in and basically form the fair trademark. Um, the big lettering is from um, when the fair that when the, um, the Tour de France came to Yorkshire and we created some land art to promote fair trade but the idea being obviously you've got aerial cameras um so it, it was bigger than that I think it said fair trade Yorkshire in huge two meter high letters and that was pinned out on on one of the fields next to where the, the uh, cyclists from the Tour de France were going to be uh, and so when uh, when the cameras took the picture they could they saw fair trade Yorkshire being being promoted so it's just there's lots of interesting ways that we can promote the idea of fair trade and get the name out there and get the word out there and get the mark better known for people. Um, this is something that this image is used by the Fairtrade Foundation on a lot of their um, promotional materials. And when you see a presentation by them, they'll quite often use this one as well. Um, and it was great because it meant that we could get volunteers involved. So the, the city of culture, Hull was a city of culture a couple of years ago. Um, and the volunteers who worked on the city of culture have carried on wanting to volunteer in new and interesting ways and so it was really easy to get them involved with uh, with this project as well um so this is just one of the ways that i have got involved with campaigning in in this in a in not outside of the traditional ways and bringing in people who wouldn't necessarily have come to an event that that, that had organized so one of the problems that we have with a lot of um, fair trade organisations and, and the, the communities is that like York Fair Trade Forum has been ex in existence since 2004. So over the 15, 16 years, you get to the stage where you're doing the same things over and over again. And when you're having the same event every fair trade fortnight and the same few people are coming, you don't feel like you're having enough of an impact. And so it's a case of, well, where do we go now? What, what else can we do to campaign within our communities? And almost, how do we redefine community? Because the two images that I just showed you, the first one where I was in York and I was with other fair trade campaigners and, 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 and the councillors. Um, and then the second one, that was the BAFTS conference. And the, there were people on that call from all over the UK. And we all came together and we've got something in common. We've got a reason to be together. And I'm sure that's the case on this call today. There's, there's people from all over the UK. Um, you will have been to other events in, in this uh, series with people from all over the world. And that's one of the wonderful things about fair trade is it connects us with people all over the world. And in particular, the farmers and workers. I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share something else with you now. Um, last year, I was working with a gentleman who um, is a fair trade banana farmer. And he decided that he, he, he loves fair trade so much that he wanted to um, help promote fair trade. Um, and this is what he came up with. I'm hoping you can hear it. It's our responsibility to support and rally behind fair trade because there is no organization in the world that stands with farmers as fair trade does. Now, let's go! Nobody support producers and farmers like we do. Like we do. Nobody honor producers 
the farmers like we do. Like we do. Nobody connect produces and farmers to consume it. All producers and farmers all around the world, all around the world, struggling for, struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade. Farmers all around the world, all around the world, struggling for, struggling for better prices, better working conditions, better terms of trade, terms of trade, new hope for the world. So that was Richard, my friend Richard. Um, he, he came up with three separate different songs for us for Fairtrade Fortnight, and we did an entire evening um, in the arts festival that I organised during Fairtrade Fortnight. And I think that's when you hear direct from producers, when you hear direct from the people who are actually benefiting from fair trade. So he works for Golden Exotics in Ghana, which is a banana, predominantly bananas. They also do uh, pineapples and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, if you want to hear more of his music, you can go, go to the Fair Trade Yorkshire YouTube channel because all three of his songs are on there and the videos that he made. So what I, what I wanted to do was to basically support him in doing whatever he wanted. So I gave him some money and he made those videos himself. Um, and I, it was it was up to him and it was giving him a voice to be able to um, to share his experiences and, and the things that he um, understands about fair trade and, and the, the impact that it has. Um, and I think when you speak to somebody direct, that makes such a difference. And I think for me, farmers as activists, farmers as campaigners is the most important thing that we can do. I'm trying to move this on. Um, there's a couple of other farmers that we that we're hearing from. So uh, this is a coffee farmer in um, in in India, and it says climate change is responsible for a decline in production and poor growth for our crops. Um, we've got cocoa farmer um, from Cote d'Ivoire, and he said climate change is a global issue. We the farmers have to deal with its consequences every day. So it's about listening to the people on the ground and what they're telling you about the things that we need to do. So this is why we're partnering with other organisations in the Climate Coalition and working um, to do important work to basically mitigate the effects of climate change on the farmers and workers in the Global South. Um, the future, I think, of fair trade is about collaborating. So for, um, fair trade is part of the Climate Coalition, but we're also working with them on the Great Big Green Week. In Scotland, it's called Climate Fringe Week, um, but it's the same week. So it's the 18th to the 26th of September this year. Um, and it's about working together. So one of the things that they're, they're supporting um, is for us to as fair trade communities, as fair trade groups, to work with other groups in our communities. So working with, uh, maybe there's a, a Greenpeace group, maybe there's a Friends of the Earth group, maybe there's a, 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 a 
sort of local recycling um, organization maybe it's transition towns maybe it's something to do with the wi or the optimists or lots and lots of other people who are working also within our communities um and i think we're stronger together i think if we work just as our our own little group of fair trade campaigners and maybe there's half a dozen of us and maybe we've been the same half dozen for the last 10 years or so um and that can get disheartening whereas if you can if you find that you can collaborate either with a fair trade group in in a, a different town the next door place or with people also working within your community that have shared aims um, it feels like we can achieve more if we do more collaboration. Um, Fashion Revolution Week is another one of the things that um, that fair trade campaigners wanted to get involved in. Um, and it isn't all around the fair trade mark. This is one of the interesting things is that what we want really as fair trade campaigners, we don't just want people to buy more chocolate. We do want people to buy chocolate that's got the fair trademark on when they have a choice between that and one that doesn't have the fair trademark on. We want to be empowering and educating people to make those choices. But equally, we want the system to change. We want the system that led to almost 1500 people dying in, in Bangladesh in 2013 when their factory collapsed. We want that system to change. We want the system whereby cocoa farmers are paid 75p a day we want that system to change we want all of these systems to be fairer and that isn't just about buying a, a, a kit kat with a fair trade mark on compared to a kit kat with the rainforest alliance mark on there's lots of other things that we need to do and campaigning around changing the way fast fashion works and campaigning around changing the way climate change um, is affecting farmers and workers. It's about having higher standards. And one of the things that people often say to me about the fair trademark is that what's the gold standard? And that's right for the industries in which fair trade mark applies so it's absolutely the gold standard in cocoa in tea and coffee you know and those sorts of, of things but there are other ways of making sure that we have high standards one of the things that really matters to me is the 10 principles of fair trade uh, which are curated by the world fair trade organization um now, I actually work for the World Fair Trade Organisation uh, in my day job um, in collaboration with the Social Enterprise UK. So, again, it's all about collaboration. Um, um, we, we're working together because it's about social and fair trade enterprise. It's about seeing the synergies between what people are doing in the UK in terms of the social enterprises that support people with mental health dif difficulties or homeless people um, and, and the, the the organisations that work around the, the world supporting people who want to um, adhere to these 10 principles. So this is what they are. So we've got opportunities for disadvantaged producers, transparency and accountability, fair trade practices, fair payment, obviously that's the big one, um, and no child labour. Those are the two that people think most, I think, when they think about fair trade. Um, so no, no discrimination, one of the greatest things that I, uh, the thing that brings me back to fair trade every time I think about it is the Women's School of Leadership in Cote d'Ivoire, because it's, that was financed by the co-op and it's, it's had, it's only been in, in existence for four or five years, but it's has a huge impact on the way women farmers think about themselves and the way they farm and the way they operate and it's been enormously empowering for them but also because it's open to men as well men can see the systemic problems that women farmers face um, and that's really important is that you know, women can't do this on their own we need we need everybody's support um, and and I think being able to change people's preconceived ideas is really important for fair trade campaigners because we we do all have preconceived ideas and so many people will tell you that the world can't change 
that, that this is how it is, that we don't, that systemic change isn't possible. Um, and it absolutely is. We can have incremental change in the interim so we can improve you know somebody's income from 75p to two pound a day but ultimately we want it to be fairer and better for people um capacity building is one of the most important things that we can do because it's about helping people understand what they can do and how they can harness their potential how we can help people fulfill their potential is the most important thing that we do as fair trade campaigners um and and it really feels like we can do that and then promotion of fair trade is that's what we're all about and obviously respect for the environment that's it didn't used to be something that people thought about within fair trade but it absolutely is now we won't now we're going more down the route of mitigating the effects of climate change um and it's basically about these people it's all about people so these uh, these are the ladies that work in one of the um wfto members in uh, in vietnam and they make bags for earth squared so you some of you may already own a bag from fair squared or you from earth squared or you may have seen them um and these are the ladies that make them um they've a lot of them have got disabilities some of them have come out of abusive relationships and it's about supporting them and promoting them um and it just shows you this is part of a fashion revolution campaign from a few years ago so it's about showing that actually garment manufacture can be done fairly it can be done properly and why wouldn't you so it's about choosing a fairer world it's about us saying this is the world that we want this is where we want to get to um this is one of the beautiful graphics that were made for the fair trade fortnight um, festival that we had um, this year. Um, and it kind of sums it up because it's got it's a global movement and it's not just about, you know, the white hand coming in and. We're not white saviors. We need to be promoting people. Black lives matter. And a lot of those black lives are in the global south and a lot of those people are working hard to produce the products that we we want to buy so we need to be harnessing their voices we need to be finding the people that have something to say about fair trade from a personal perspective from the producers and giving them a voice and giving them an opportunity to share their stories um and that's how we nurture our world because our world is people the world is made up of people and we are the custodians of it we humanity and the farmers in particular um the first image that i showed you was me standing effectively on a picket line <laughs> uh protesting against nestle um that was a quite an, a noisy protest even though we were all wearing masks um this is a much quieter way of, of, of campaigning craftivism it's something that i really like um because not everybody can get out and stand and get arrested and protest and be noisy we can do things in our own homes just to to, to quietly protest and i love this manifesto where it's about doing it slowly it's about thinking about the messages that we want to get out there and crafting something with our own hands that that says this is about us standing with you so solidarity and not sympathy that's important um comforting contemplation empathy never points fingers small and beautiful that's lovely and humility holds the key so it's not about saying i'm the best campaigner in the world everybody look at me it's about saying i can learn from people i can learn from others experiences um provoke don't preach so it's thinking about how do we make people think because if you start talking at people they switch off but if you give them something to think about then they'll go away and think about it and then you may change minds there and then positivity is really important and making the change you wish to see so it's up to us now tonight there is um an event on with um 
Bournemouth University and where we're all coming together and we're going to handcraft a hand and we're going to make a wave of hope. Um, and it's all about bringing us together from all over the UK again and the future for campaigning. It's entirely up to us. It's up to us to decide. We are the campaigners. We are the people who decide how we want to get our message across. So what I want the National Campaigner Committee to do is to empower the campaigners to get that message across in whatever way works for them. So it needs to be led by the people who are on the ground, who are working hard, who are making and growing the things that we want to buy. But it's about some systemic change. So just buying a few more chocolate bars isn't going to change the world. We need to be campaigning for things to be different. And this is where shared, shared interest is great because it's a completely different way of financing what's going on in, um, in the global south. It's about making sure that, that people have um, the opportunity to, to fulfill their potentials. It's, it's a wonderful organization. Um, it's about collaborating, working with partnerships, but it's also about that solidarity between the consumer and the producer. So we, as the Global North, we're the consumers of the products, but we need to have solidarity with workers um, in, the, in the Global South. Um, it's about being kind, but it's about taking the opportunity that we've been given by this pause, this global pause that was forced on us um, to, to build back fairer and to think about how we can do that and how we can choose the world that we want. Um, so for me, it's about combining the two areas of fair trade. So fair trade, one word, capital letter, that's how it's always been in the UK in terms of fair trade communities. But I think working with the 10 principles, working with other organisations that are acting in the same sphere that we are, we can choose change, we can make things happen. Um, and I'm really excited about the possibilities. Thank you very much, Joanna. Wow, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we do, I think, have a few minutes, if you're okay for time, Joanna, to take yeah. any questions or, or comments that people might have. Um, just um, a reminder to everyone that we are recording this session. If you ask a question and your video is on, you will appear in the recording. So if you do not wish to be visible, please turn off your video before asking your question. You might also need a rem reminder to unmute your microphone. Um, I know that in the chat there was a question about tonight's event, Joanna. I don't know if you can share more information about how people can potentially participate in that. If that's a link, I'm happy for you to send that to me and we can then share that with everybody. Yeah. Um, or if it's I think that's, thing. that's probably easiest because it's not me that's organised it. It's a no problem. It's, yeah, Fair Trade Foundation, so I'll send you the link. Right, and I'll make sure that everybody on the call at the moment gets that, no problem at all. Um, so if there are any uh, any further questions, um, please do unmute yourself um, and uh, ask, ask away. Just a reminder also, if you don't want to appear in the recording, to turn your video off as well, please. Thank you. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. Um, oh, where, where am I moving to? Um, yeah, Hadfield. Um, so, yeah, basically, um, it's about 15 miles outside uh, Manchester. If you've ever seen the League of Gentlemen, um, it's Royston Vasey. That's where I'm moving to. <laughs> so that's where the shots uh, the League of Gentlemen. And it genuinely is like that. Everybody knows everybody else. It's a very strange place, but I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and does Royce and Vasey know what to expect? Do they know you're <laughs> I, I, I lived there for seven years before, so yeah, it's, it, it may remember me. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll keep an eye out for it on the fair trade map, I'm sure. <laughs> um, are there any other questions for Joanna or, or comments at all? Um, Colin, it looks like you've got a question, maybe. Um, hi, Joanna. Um, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what you thought about campaigning through influencing the big retailers in stocking fair trade products. Um, to my mind, that sounds like quite an influential thing you could do. I mean, for instance, Waitrose, if you buy a banana from Waitrose, they're all fair trade. So I, I imagine that must have made a big difference to, um, to fair trade producers. I just wonder what you thought of that. 
yeah i think i think that's that's really important because one of th one of the interesting things about the uk is that so much of what we buy comes through supermarkets so you're actually never going to succeed with systemic change unless you get the, the supermarkets on board um because the, the reason that one in three bananas is fair trade in the UK is because you go into Sainsbury's, you go into the co-op, you go into Waitrose and you don't have a choice. If you want a banana, you are buying a fair trade banana. Um, I've often said that fair traders are an unusual bunch in that we, we don't want our job to exist. I don't want fair trade to exist in 25 years time because I want all trade to be fair. I want the default to be fair trade um, and that there to be a thing of unfair trade that's the thing you know the worst possible scenario and at the moment that the default is unfair trade and fair trade is a very small niche and it's a case of one of the ways that we do it there's, there's, there's basically two ways we can tackle it we either make the ethical companies bigger or we make the big companies ethical we need to do both so um, we need to be supporting businesses that are ethical, uh, which is one of the reasons that um, I'm involved with the eBay for Change, because actually changing it, it, eBay for Change does both. But so eBay is an enormous organisation and we are trying to make it more ethical by encouraging it to support fair trade and social enterprises. But equally, those individual fair trade and social enterprises by through partnership with eBay are going to get bigger. So actually the market share that, that goes to ethically run businesses has got to improve. So yeah, you do both. So it's a two pronged approach and definitely working with supermarkets because, because that's where we shop, that will have a huge impact. One of the problems that we have, of course, is that things are tight. For all, for, for all of us, really, but certainly supermarkets are always looking for ways that they can cut costs. And so we need to be loud in our communities to say we are not prepared. Exactly what happened with the Sainsbury's campaign when they switched their own brand tea from fair trade to fairly traded and we weren't having any of that so we went I remember standing outside the fair trade uh, standing outside Sainsbury's in York doing a photo shoot um, looking sad with teapots um, but they didn't like that and we went in with a, with a petition and we handed a letter to the, the assistant manager who said I completely agree with you <laughs> to be fair um, that, that they shouldn't have been doing it and one of the worries that we had was that that would be the thin end of the wedge and that they would start do bringing in other products that were fairly traded rather than fair trade and that hasn't happened so we as campaigners and activists we can have an important role within our communities to, to stand up and say we're not prepared to put up with this um i think <laughs> One of the things that I've started doing as Fair Trade Yorkshire's Twitter account, um, I, I do this thing called Adventures in Fair Trade. So whenever I find something that's unusual, that's got a fair trade mark on it, or it's from a WFTO producer, I'll tweet about it. Um, and I'm finding that in Lidl, there's lots and lots of products that have got the white fair trade mark. So they've, they've, they're part of the COCO programme. Um, but actually, I, having spoken to cocoa farmers in Cote d'Ivoire and in Ghana, I know how important that is for them. And so being able to see the fair trade mark and to publicise the fact that you're buying this because it's got the fair tra trade mark on it, um, that makes a big difference, I think, because nobody's going to be doing that with Rome Forest Alliance. Nobody's going to be doing that with us. Nobody's doing it with all of these lesser marks. We, we care show we care publicize it um and absolutely we yeah we have to work with uh, with the with the big boys and and make them more ethical because that that's where the money is thank you joanna um i'm conscious of, of time here um but ian i see you've just popped up so we'll come to ian for for your question and then if there are any further questions do feel free to send those through to myself and we'll make sure that we get a response from Joanna with those. Um, so Ian, over to you for your question. Thank you. Did you have a question, Ian? Uh, Ian's, he's not muted, but I can't hear him. 
No, we seem to be having a problem with your audio, Ian, unfortunately. It looks like you're not muted. Do you want to ask it in the chat if you have that capacity? That we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi, Chris. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. I, if, if, if Ian wants to type away, I'll, I'll start speaking if that's all right. No problem. OK. Um, just a couple of thoughts and observations, really, and catching up. Fantastic. Really enjoyed the presentation, Joe, and that's superb. Really, really, really good. Um, Zoom, for me, has been a bit in itself a bit of a revolution. And I just think that must create us a whole load of new opportunities for, for doing things in different ways. And I, but I, I campaign across so many areas that, you know, fair trade is, there, forgive me, but one of them, but, but, I, but I think it's very complementary the sort of areas I campaign in. So it's loads of climate change and, and all the rest of it. But one thing that I just think that would help either shared interest, and so I raise this as a thought, uh, and if you said you worked for, I'm not quite sure, you said something like the World Fair Trade Organization you worked for, but, or something like that. But, well, in the past, and, and some of you will remember somebody like Duncan Reese from the co-op, um, we would have brought a producer over from Costa Rica or somewhere. Well, I, I suspect that the world will not be doing so much of that anymore, partly because of the mileage and the cost of, of cl and the cl climate change. But if you could vet uh, and shared interest could line them up and vet them and sort them out for us and tell us who you've got, we could sort of book them for one or two Zoom presentation events and, and you could get them at a predictable time, be it around fair trade fortnight or approaching Christmas or around Easter or whenever you thought were the clever, clever moments to go for the opportunity. So what we need, therefore, is a, is a sort of a, a background. Say we wanted one on tea or we won that wanted one from um, Costa Rica or we wanted something from Uganda. Do you see what I mean? So there are a variety of divisions. So I just wonder if, if Zoom is an opportunity, therefore, for us all. Um, I, I will be working at the festivals with Oxfam on climate change. So I do wonder if Oxfam should be one of our big kind of partner ideas. And um, I, I lob in now because it wasn't mentioned, but I, I see that they're coming in lots of towns, incredible edibles. Uh, and they're working on food in this country, but they're a good group to engage with on, on all issues like food and climate change. Yeah, That's you're absolutely there. right. I know, well, I know WFTO Europe is working on a project of, around local food. Um, that, that sounds really interesting. And I think I know that's something that a lot of local groups are involved with. So one of the groups not, not far from me is Pocklington and their fair trade group is called the Fair Trade and Local Action Group. So it's all about the, the, the synergies between um, supporting employment in rural areas in the UK basically which is what farming is as well as uh, in the global south so yeah absolutely there's lots of synergies um, and I think you're right that one of the that, that Zoom op offers huge opportunities to, to speak direct to farmers and workers. Um, one of the things that with the, the NCC wants to do is to, to but put together a series of events and offer the offer them as something that groups can come together in person. So that, so you 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 have your standard sort of steering group meeting for an hour or so, and you watch one of the events that the NCC has curated for you, and then there's a discussion afterwards. And that's something that I think offers lots of potential. And I think hybrid events where people are in a room. But then also it's it's either live streamed or it's recorded and people can can tune in at the same time. That's something that we did with the Bass Conference in 2019 in Manchester. Everything that wasn't sort of commercially sensitive, we just live streamed it on Facebook. So anybody who wasn't able to be there in person, they could watch it um, and they could watch it on catch up. And, you know, the, you don't have to do things in real time as well as well. So there's huge opportunities that that this the fact that we are all sitting in our houses and we're able to talk to each other um, and whether we're on a tea farm or a banana farm or a coffee farm or in a garment factory or um, in a basket weaving factory or what all of those places you know little workshops um, Zaytun and uh, Hadil as well Hadil did a few events where they um, they went into 
Palestinian workshops and we saw people making things. Um, and that's so lovely, just being able to make that connection to a place that you're probably never going to visit. We can be all over the world and not leave our home offices. It's great. <laughs> It, it certainly is, isn't it? It's fantastic. And it's so fantastic to be able to, to have you all joining us from all your parts of the UK at the moment, not, not quite the world. And um, thank you for those, those points, uh, Christopher. Um, because of time, I am going to draw us to a close now. But as I say, if you do have any further questions, comments for Joanna, do email them through and we'll pass them on. Um, Ian had an observation which was really around um, the idea of kind of fair trade versus price um, sort of thing thing and so was just commenting that it was good for you to highlight Lidl as being able to address both of those points the affordability perhaps of, of products as well as the fair trade mark um, and also just going back to to your point um, in the, the, the last session there the last sort of question there about Zoom and the capacity that it enables us to, to reach uh, further afield um, we do currently have a couple of events coming up we're halfway through our latest series of member events which this year have been online um, using Zoom um, and we have been joined by producers at the previous two events and we have upcoming um, the two events we have um, producers from Chile and Nicaragua joining us in the next few weeks so head over to our website for details of those in case you haven't spotted those. Um, so I would just like to say a huge thank you to Joanna um, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your enthusiasm, your passion, your time, um, your commitment to, to the cause. Um, and I know that anybody who's on the call who's met you knows that you're just fizzing and bubbling with, uh, with fair trade energy. So that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on what the future of fair trade campaigning looks like. Um, as this does form part of our um, Volunteers Week celebrations, I just want to close by sharing with you our special message to you all. Um, thank you very much for all that you do supporting um, shared interests. So a little uh, thank you from our friends Super Avo and Captain Coco there. Um, so thank you again. Um, as I say, if you do have any questions or comments, do send them through and we'll certainly share those details of that event tonight um, with you and uh, we'll pass on anything else that, uh, that Joanna might want to, to share with you as well and um, that she, she shares. So thank you again, Joanna, and thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you again, maybe this afternoon at some of our other sessions. Take care, everyone. everyone.